do not give me a piece of carrot cake if it doesn't have cream cheese frosting. There is no carrot cake that I want to eat that doesn't have cream cheese frosting. Hey everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. Welcome to my home kitchen. Today I'm making a recipe from my book Dessert Person and it is for one of my favorite layer cakes in the book. It is a carrot pecan cake. It has obviously fresh carrots, a bunch of pecans, some fresh ginger in it, and it has a brown butter cream cheese frosting, which is so delicious, not to be missed, and it is an amazing celebration cake. It is not that complicated. Not that complicated. I love carrot cake. That is obviously not a unique um, or novel position, but I have just strong memories of carrot cake growing up. My mom had has these two community cookbooks from Cleveland. One is called Box Lunch and one is called Bach for More, but it's B-A-C-H as in Johann Sebastian because they're from like the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra's you know, like Booster Club or whatever it was. And like, they're the, I love community cookbooks. Also like in that, in that cookbook, she has little handwritten notes in the margins and the, mar the note just says like, this recipe has too much oil. But it's like, maybe tell us what the right amount of oil is instead of just being like, this is wrong. <laughs> anyway, so I think like, there's a lot of those kinds of recipes that maybe we've had in childhood and they set the benchmark for what a re that, you know, that recipe should taste like. So for me, it's her carrot cake, and this is my interpretation of that cake, but with the right amount of oil. Like a lot of layer cakes, this recipe calls for a stand mixer. You could make the cake with a hand mixer, although I think you won't get something as light in texture. Three eight inch cake pans. Other than that, it's using stuff that you probably have in your kitchen. You need a box grater for the carrots, bunch of bowls, spatula, of course, there's carrots, there's vanilla, the oil instead of butter, all the kind of usual hallmarks of a carrot cake. But this recipe also includes buttermilk. I mix it with the grated carrot. I also have brown and white sugars. I have a bunch of spices. I like a combo of cinnamon, ground ginger, and ground clove. Also some fresh ginger that I'm gonna peel and grate. You'll see like walnuts a lot in carrot cake. I actually really like using pecans. I think pecans and all those warm spices and all those flavors go really well. Flour, eggs, you know, you've seen all this stuff before. Because I want my nuts to be cooled when I add them to the cake, I'm gonna start first by toasting them and then while I get everything else together, they can cool. So a cup and a half of pecans. So those are going in a 350 oven. I'll leave my oven on 350 for baking and I'll set a timer because it is unbelievably easy to burn nuts. While the nuts are toasting, the first thing I wanna do is grate my carrots. I remember being yelled at in culinary school for peeling carrots too slowly. It's like, as fast as humanly possible. And I was like, well, this is as fast as I go. It was just a dick. <laughs> I would just be like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. Not that I wasn't, I wasn't like going that slow. Well, I, I am kind of going slow. Okay, so I'm gonna start grating. With skinny carrots like this, I'll actually do multiple at a time. Don't be a hero. When you get down to the nub, just get rid of it. It's not worth grating your knuckles. That's my pecan timer. I think they could go a little longer. Maybe another minute or two. All right, so I'm getting rid of my little carrot nubs. I'll feed it to my goat. This is going to be my wet ingredients. So to this, I'll add my buttermilk. Um, buttermilk is at room temperature. Everything that's out is at room temperature. Two teaspoons vanilla extract. And now I'm gonna do my ginger in here. So I need a tablespoon. Oh my God, but, uh, how long has it been? So much more than one minute. Wow, just in the nick of time. Oh God, I'd burn these. All right, so I really well toasted my pecans. I'm gonna get these onto a different tray so that they don't continue to toast. All right, 
you're such a fool. I think they're fine. I, I got them just in the nick of time. Back to the ginger. So basically you use a spoon and kind of hold it like so. And then just a scraping motion to take the skin off. So I don't really care that much about getting every last bit. So I'm gonna grate this. Here is my tablespoon measure. So now I just wanna stir this, get all that ginger incorporated, and I'll let this hang out while I finish all the prep. So like the pans, the dry ingredients, all that. I want to make sure I can unmold the layers easily and with no issue, with nothing sticking. So I always line cake pans with parchment paper. The way that I usually prefer is just to actually trace around the pan and cut the circle. And then I cut inside of the line to account for the thickness of the sides. So I'm giving it maybe like an eighth of an inch. So there's the round and it fits comfortably inside the pan. So now, I just wanna grease the pans because you want the parchment to stick to the pan. So that's, you know, like a, a light drizzle of oil. So once you've coated it, go ahead and lay your parchment round down. And then you have your prepped pan ready to go. Now I'm gonna to put together my dry ingredients and the first step of doing that is to pulverize my toasted pecans. So here they've been cooling. I just wanna say I'm, I'm quite happy with the level of toast on them. They are very, very brown. So I'm putting them inside of a bag. You could process them in a food processor. But as we've covered extensively, I sort of have a weird dislike of getting out my food processor. I also kind of like this step because it's fun. So just press out the air. So this part is just doing this. And I want it to be like fine, but I'm not trying to get the fineness of like almond flour from the store because I'll be here forever. I just want things to be well broken down into something, you know, coarse meal. I really like that there's some larger pieces and then some really, really fine pieces. That's all good. I like all of that variation. This is where we're gonna mix our dry ingredients. So this is all-purpose flour. I have kosher salt, baking soda, and baking powder, then ground clove, ground ginger, ground cinnamon. I mentioned that we're starting with the whisk attachment, and that is because the first step in this cake, as is often the step in any oil-based cake, is to actually whip the eggs and the sugar. And that's because we're not using butter, so I'm not starting with that creaming step, or I'm incorporating a bunch of air into that butter-sugar mixture. Instead, I'm gonna incorporate air by whipping the eggs with the sugar and making it super frothy. So I have four large eggs at room temp, three quarters of a cup each of dark brown sugar, and then three quarters of a cup granulated. I'm gonna start this on low. I wanna break up those yolks and get it all smooth. This will aerate and lighten until we get something called ribbon. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. And in the meantime, this just needs to beat for a little while. And I'm gonna turn up the speed to medium high. So obviously the texture has totally transformed. It is light, airy, thick. All right, let me show you what I mean by the term ribbon. Um, you'll often see the phrase slowly dissolving ribbon, which is my favorite phrase in all of recipe writing language. So basically the mixture falls off of the whisk or the attachment, whatever you're using, and back onto itself. And it creates this kind of like, it creates a ribbon. I don't know how else to describe it. So now with the mixer running, I'm gonna start streaming in the oil and I wanna go slowly so that they emul it emulsifies. Too much oil too quickly can overwhelm the eggs. Okay, so now we have the oil added. This is the point at which I'm going to change from the whisk attachment to the paddle. And now I'm following the basic tenant of cake making, which is wet and dry ingredients alternating. So three additions of flour, two of the wet, starting with dry and ending with dry. The remaining wet mixture, which is the second half, and then the remaining dry ingredients. Carrot cake is usually a rather liquidy batter. It's not like a thick, fluffy 
better like you see often with like a yellow cake or something. So that's normal. So just give the sides a scrape a little bit. Just give it a couple turns. Let's talk about the crazy stuff that people put in their carrot cake. I, I don't categorically dislike raisins. I actually like raisins, or I think we should call them sun-dried grapes, um, in savory applications, like in pilafs or braises. I don't love it in baked goods, um, so I, I choose not to add raisins to my carrot cake. They are optional if you want to go ahead and add. But I really don't endorse things like crushed pineapple or like sweetened shredded coconut. I think there is a time and a place for those. I just don't want them in my carrot cake. That's just to me, it's, it's kind of a different thing. All right, so now I'm gonna use my scale to weigh out the same amount of batter in each pan. And it's 595 grams or one pound, five ounces. I have a rack in the upper third and a rack in the lower third. But the idea is to stagger them. So you don't want a pan to bake directly above another pan because it's gonna block the heat. So I'm gonna arrange them two spread out and one in the middle. So I'm gonna go this guy on top. And then the other two below and staggered so they're off to the sides. Now because of where they are, the two below are closer to the side of the oven. And that just means I wanna rotate because they're gonna bake a little unevenly. So when you're baking layers, rotating is always a good idea. So I'm gonna switch the positions of the layers and also give the pans themselves a little turn. All right, so these will bake for about a half an hour. We'll come back, I'll show you what they look like when they're done. Cream cheese frosting. Philadelphia cream cheese. And let me just extend that concept of like, I don't want carrot cake without cream cheese frosting. I don't want carrot cake without cream cheese frosting made with Philadelphia. Not SponCon. I just really like Philly cream cheese. So I have a pound of it here, two eight ounce packs. Room temperature, every, okay, it's very important with any frosting that everything is room temperature because I am trying to mix cream cheese and butter. And if the butter is slightly colder than the cream cheese, the butter will, won't quite mix in and I'll end up having like little butter pieces in there, which I don't want. I want it to be smooth and light and lump free. But first I'm gonna do one pre-step, which is browning the butter. I have my saucepan right here. I'll start out on medium high to get everything melted and then up to a boil. And then as that water boils off, I will moderate the heat and kind of turn it down. The thing about browning butter is make sure you give it a stir fairly often. And I'm using a flexible spatula because you want to scrape the sides so that no milk solids start to stick to the bottom or sides. All right, let's check. I'm gonna check this guy, which I think is done. So here you can see Super even, beautiful surface. She is done. You know, it's funny, with carrot cake, you'll really start to see if your oven isn't level, because like the cakes will be slightly tipped to one side because the batter is kind of liquid. Done. Ooh, and we're boiling. Like I've said in the past, I have to actively try not to put brown butter in basically every recipe. This is one application where the brown butter is really the star and you get this awesome combination of like tangy, delicious cream cheese and super toasty caramelized butter and like it's the best frosting. Felix, kitty. What's he all turned about? What kitty? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I can tell that this is going to start turning brown pretty quickly because those like big boiling water kind of bubbles have given way to a smaller, like foamier kind of bubble. So I just know that that means that most of the water is gone. If you're on like a pretty high heat, like anything medium or above, go ahead and turn it down. So once you're like, that looks good for brown butter, I have a really, really deep golden color. Um, that's when you probably want to take it out of the pan. If you've timed yourself perfectly, you can let the butter rest in here and it will carry over just enough that you have that optimal brown butter point. But if you had a lot of heat under it, it will, it will actually burn if you leave it in there. So I often transfer out of the pan just to make sure I'm not gonna overshoot the mark. I'm gonna pour this into the bowl of the stand mixer and now see all those golden bits. 
basically I want this butter to solidify again. We don't have all day, so I'm actually gonna mix it over an ice bath just to get it to set and cool off completely. I can't tell you how great it is to have an ice machine. I mean, living in New York apartments makes you so grateful for things that I think in other places are like considered fairly standard, like a dishwasher. So this will cool down the butter pretty quickly. So this will start to thicken. You'll notice that it's thicker. I don't know how else to describe it. And as soon as it starts to kind of go opaque is when I'll stop stirring. It looks so cool. Here is the butter. I stirred it over the ice until it was opaque, but not cold and not hardened. So you can see it's still soft. So I'm gonna add my cream cheese. On set, my, uh, the food stylist for my book, a friend named Astrid. Astrid is gluten-free, and so she couldn't really try most of the things that we were making, because only a few recipes in the book are gluten-free, but she would just like go home at the end of the day with like a half pint of frosting <laughs> and just eat that. Sorry, Astrid, I hope you don't mind that I shared that story. The point of that story was you can just eat the frosting. And I just wanna get this on low to mix it all together and get it smooth. So that mixture is smooth. I'm gonna add my vanilla bean. So you can use extract. I do think that this is a time to splurge if you have vanilla bean. They are very pricey, but it adds such fantastic flavor. So I'm just scraping down the length of the pod and it's extracting all of those seeds. But because vanilla is so precious, vanilla only grows within 50 miles of either side of the equator. And also like climate change is affecting its growth. So I like to save the pods. I don't wanna waste any part of it. And I just add it to my little jar of homemade vanilla. It still has work to do. To that I'm adding a generous pinch of kosher salt, and this recipe just uses an entire one pound bag. Which seems crazy, but it makes a lot. And add all of it. If I were to turn this on, it would just, you know, like blow it up into a cloud in my face. So I pulse the mixture to combine everything. And the towel just keeps it from like flying everywhere. And so now that the sugar has really disappeared, now I can start to beat it. I just feel very grateful to like the pastry goddesses that cream cheese frosting is one of the easiest and also the best. All right, so this is almost done. This is our cream cheese frosting. Because we brown that butter, this frosting has a tendency to be a little bit loose in consistency. So if this frosting won't hold its shape and won't hold a peak, see that peak? When I flip it over, see how it doesn't really hold? This is a little bit loose, so it's gonna be difficult to frost a cake with this because it's not gonna hold its shape. I find that the best method is to just put the whole bowl in the fridge. But where? Where in the fridge? All right, so I'll just give that a stir every few minutes and then we'll move on to making our cake. So this is the frosting that we let chill a little bit. It is definitely thickened a bit. It'll hold a soft peak like so. Cake frosting and decorating can be, I mean, it is an art, absolutely, but it's all up to you about how far you wanna take it. You know, at its most basic, cake, cake frosting just requires an offset spatula or even like a butter knife, and that's it. I'm gonna put it on this cake stand. And in order to protect the stand from getting messy and sticky with frosting, I cover it with strips of parchment paper, like so. So here are my parchment strips. Now I cut around with my little offset spatula just to make sure there's no sticking around the sides, just to give it something to kind of adhere to. Put a dollop of frosting in the middle of that plate, and that helps to keep the layer from sliding around. Peel off that parchment. This obviously is a generous amount of cream cheese frosting, which is the only way I had to make cream cheese frosting. I'm gonna start by putting about a cup of frosting down. Just gonna spread this amount of frosting across the surface, all the way to the very edge. So I'm actually just going to then just place it on top. So now I like to get eye level with the cake. 
I'm looking for a couple things. I'm looking that the layers are lined up and like stacked one on top of the other. I'm also looking to see that the top is level. And so then give it a spin, see that the sides are aligned. You can kind of shift it over a little. Okay, so another cup or so of frosting. Now the last layer on top. Okay, that looks pretty good. We've stacked our layers, they're filled. Now we are going to move on to a stage called the crumb coat. A crumb coat is basically a very thin layer of frosting. And then when you go to put the real layer of frosting on top, those crumbs are not gonna get mixed into your frosting. So you need very little for this. A lot, I learned a lot of cake decorating for YouTube many, many, many years ago. I decided to do something totally unhinged and make a wedding cake. And then I was like, I don't know how to make a wedding cake. So I watched a bunch of YouTube videos and it's super helpful, but at the same time, without any like real formal training, I think there's probably a lot of tricks that I don't know. So I've just sort of taught myself to do it the way that makes sense to me. So for all those cake artists out there, I defer to your expertise. This is ready to go into the fridge. After a crumb coat, it's always a good idea to give it a little time in the fridge so it can chill and start to set. Oh yeah, yeah. how am I gonna do this? It's always my problem. Well, I have four quarts of cookie dough. Ah! Oh God. Okay, another tip. Make room in your fridge before you start this step. Oh, thank God. And actually, I'm gonna leave that space in there because I'll probably throw this cake back in the fridge when I'm done, just so that final layer of frosting can fully set. I go really natural with this cake and I just kind of let it be like swirly and loose and, and not like one of those perfect finished cakes. So I'm just gonna work this frosting down the sides. So again, like it's easier to actually remove frosting than to put more on. So putting on more than you need is fine. Okay, so this is the frosting. I actually think it's, a, it's the right amount. I just wanna kind of go back in and give it some more texture. So this is also the kind of the point where like, you could just sit here and keep going over and over and over. And at some point you just gotta be like, I'm good with this. This cake is glistening, it's a little warm in here. I'm gonna pop this one back into the fridge and then, and then we get to cut and eat it. So there's the cake. I love the swirls, I think it looks great. Slide the parchment up underneath. There is kind of an art to like cake slicing. Make sure that you are going straight down. Sometimes what I end up doing is like, I think I'm cutting down, but I'm kind of cutting at an angle. Um, and I also cut a little bit past that midway point of the cake. And that enables me to get like a nice sharp point. But like sometimes the first slice just doesn't come out looking great and that's fine. I mean, not to toot my own horn. It was the best carrot cake I've ever had. The perfect texture, the right amount of carrot and spice, and you got all those 90 pecans, but truly the thing that makes this cake is the frosting. All right, who doesn't love carrot cake? It is ideal for like any occasion, unless you're cooking for a one-year-old's birthday party, in which case he might hate it. Elliot, obviously I haven't forgotten. Thank you for watching. I love showing you recipes from Dessert Person. There'll be more to come. In the meantime, I will be here eating my cake. Thank you for watching. Hey everyone, it's Claire. I wanna thank you for watching me bake from my cookbook, Dessert Person. There's another book I wanna show you by fellow Penguin Random House author, Melissa Clark. This one is called Dinner in French. You probably know Melissa's work from the New York Times. She's been making recipes on our dinner tables for years. And this is her spin on classic French recipes, but with a real modern, uh, fresh twist. It's such a beautiful book, super practical for home cooks. So check it out wherever books are sold, and thank you for watching.